every animal tries to avoid being killed. Self-preservation was programmed in us by evolution so that we don't all accidentally become extinct. But you probably realize that some species are luckier than others. Like the catfish superfamily, Loricariidae. Ever heard of it? These fish, or rather several species of them, were blessed with so many abilities and special features that are worth attention. First of all, these catfish have built-in armor. For example, bristlenose catfish are covered with a tough body armor with spines around their heads. And these are not just spines, they enlarge if the fish is in danger. Other catfish species are even more interesting. When a catfish feels threatened by a larger fish, it may extend the retractable spines that are usually close to its sides. This makes its body wider, which means it'll be more difficult to swallow such prey. Well, if the predator tries to do that anyway, sharp spines will cut into its mouth. The predator's lucky if those are ordinary spines because some species of catfish are actually venomous. Moreover, the venom of some catfish is so potent that it can kill a human. Approximately half of all known catfish species, there are about 3,000 of them, are likely venomous. But this ability is only used by fish as a defense. When the catfish sets its spines in motion, the pressure rips the skin over the venom glands. The venom spills out and gets into the wounds of the predator. As you remember, by that time, the predator is already wounded by sharp spines. But back to the armor that nature bestowed upon catfish, the entire superfamily Loricariidae has it, and yet I want to focus on certain species. The three-striped cori is a very small fish, the length of which doesn't exceed 2.5 inches. They're kept in aquariums, and no one even expects they can survive a piranha bite. To find out about this, the scientists had to pit two fish against each other in an aquarium and see what happens. Imagine how surprised they were when a cori was cornered, bitten 10 times, and then wriggled free and swam away looking irritated. Cory wasn't hurt or scared, just annoyed. Any other fish would lose part of its organs in just one bite. The secret to the amazing durability of the three-striped cori lies precisely in the armor, the scales of which are made of collagen and minerals able to withstand enormous pressure. Cori scales grow from osteoblasts, the cells responsible for building bones. A hardtop mineral layer of scales prevents the piranha's teeth from piercing the armor and the soft layer underneath absorbs the force of bites. The scales don't split, the piranha is left without lunch, and the three-striped cori can keep doing whatever it does. Piranhas need to make eight bites just to put a dent in cori's tail armor, and breaking through their abdominal scales works only 20% of the time. Well, even these amazing fish have a chink in their armor, the area around the gills with a gap. If the piranha sinks its teeth there, it can decapitate the cori. To prevent this from happening, they flare out sharp spines on their pectoral fins and back and drive away predators. And how do you like the ability of catfish to breathe air? I mean, swimming to the surface and taking a breath. To gain this ability, the catfish had to evolve several modifications of the digestive tract that function as accessory respiratory organs. While this is not a kind of skill you might show off in front of your fish pals at a party, Breathing air is required for survival. In some water bodies, there's too little oxygen dissolved in the water. In order not to suffocate, the catfish had to come up with something, but they used this method of breathing only as a last resort and only under stress. Also, in order to breathe with the stomach, it must have a little food inside, so you either eat or you breathe. But these aren't the only unique abilities granted to catfish by evolution, because some catfish can survive without any water. Common plecos from the Loricaridae family are known to survive out of the water for up to 30 hours. So people sell them in the markets alive, simply laying them on the counter. The catfish should thank the scales for this ability to live without water. The thing is, catfish are quite easy to spot in the water, so they become prey for birds. But the birds quickly realize that they've grabbed something prickly and very hard. After a couple of attempts to eat the fish, they give up throw it away, and try to find a less feisty lunch. As a result, the catfish ends up on land and has to survive without water for some time until it manages to get to its native reservoir. Yes, you heard it right. These guys can also move on land. They get to the water in bursts of 3.3 feet per second, which of course is slow from a human point of view. But hey, we're talking about fish here. 
Fish aren't supposed to walk on land at all, let alone climbing walls like the Chetostoma microp species does, which belongs to the same family of catfish. Imagine the surprise of people who were the first to see this. A team exploring limestone caves in Ecuador found a fish climbing nearly 10 feet up almost vertical rock walls. What about gravity? <laughs> Seems like this fish never heard of it. And you, like scientists, probably wondered how a fish can climb walls. Well, it looks like the climbing ability emerged from a series of modifications to the catfish's fins, skin, and mouth. Yes, they use their mouth to climb. Add to this a thin film of water on the wall and you get a rock climbing fish. At this point, I wanted to make a joke like, what's next, fish that eat wood? But then Steve showed me the panache species. They also belong to the same catfish family. They're armored, have spines, and they eat wood. Moreover, they gnaw it. What for? Well, there's a simple reason, actually. Intense rivalry for resources forced the panache to find a way not to die out. And they discovered that there's always a lot of wood at the bottom. To include it in their diet, the fish have grown spoon-shaped teeth and jaws positioned at a high angle. But it's not as simple when it comes to digestion. Some researchers point to special intestinal bacteria that help the panache with this. Other scientists argue that fish simply can't digest wood. It passes through their guts in less than four hours, and catfish intestines don't have any unique structure. But what's the point of eating wood, then? The Panache catfish appear to be chewing on rotting wood to digest the organic matter, microbes, and microbial byproducts found in the spaces between the wood fibers, and the wood itself is excreted as waste. Other freshwater catfish from the same family are so tough they can live in salt water. Usually in such conditions, the fish quickly dies from dehydration. Its kidneys are designed to pump water out of the body all the time, retaining salts. But catfish don't care about such trifles, nor do they care about the fact that they're fish, not moles. Actually, after walking on the ground, rock climbing and eating wood, there's not much that can surprise you about catfish. Common plecos, which I've already mentioned, are also known for burrowing into the banks, so intensely that they cause erosion and collapses. But other catfish like to dig too, for very different reasons. For example, to avoid unpleasant sunlight and heat, to care for offspring or stay safe from predators, apparently when all other defense mechanisms no longer work. All this is quite exciting, but hardly for those creatures whose houses can collapse simply because catfish just love digging. Though this is not the only problem caused by catfish from this family. Since they're really good at survival, species from the Loricariodae superfamily easily become invasive. It makes perfect sense. When you're this good at adapting to everything and fending off predators, you are, by definition, cooler than everyone else. Plus, there's also people who keep catfish as aquarium pets and then release them back into the wild. This is how, for example, common plecos appeared in Florida, Texas, and Mexico. The catfish were released there on purpose, in order to control algae. In the end, the catfish spread to at least 13 Mexican states, displacing native species and causing serious harm to thousands of Mexican families whose income depends on fishing. In general, in Mexico, common plecos are not very liked, and even got the nickname devilfish. To get rid of the invasive species, catfish can be eaten more often, but locals consider the fish ugly, odd, and poisonous. This slows things down. But the strangest issue caused by the invasive catfish has to do with the manatees. Catfish cling to them. There may be 20, 30, or even 40 fish on one unfortunate manatee. It looks creepy, as if the catfish are going to tear it apart. Though actually, the catfish are not interested in either the blood or the meat of the manatees. They just feed on the algae growing on their skin. That is, they cause no physical harm, but imagine 40 creatures the size of a cat clinging to you. It's irritating. For manatees as well. In an attempt to lose catfish, they move more, and movement means burning calories. This is not good for manatees. The thing is, in the winter months, in order to escape cold and find food, manatees swim to the waters of Florida, which are teeming with catfish. But instead of a relaxing holiday, manatees get a bunch of annoying fish they can't get rid of. As a result, manatees lose weight and leave warm waters much sooner than they're supposed to. 
Eventually, a tired animal that lost weight finds itself in the cold. The result is quite predictable. Manatees get sick and die. Turns out that evolution gave catfish the ability to survive in any conditions, and they ruined everything. Well, nature has a rather weird sense of humor. If you ask a random person what fish they're most scared of, they'll most likely say it's a shark. Yeah, sharks have a reputation for being bloodthirsty predators, ready to devour anyone with extreme cruelty. However, there are fish you should fear much more than sharks. Actually, compared to them, sharks seem like peaceful and innocent creatures. Meet needlefish, a family of ray-finned fish that prey on other fish. A signature feature of needlefish is a long, narrow beak with many sharp teeth. Needlefish look a bit ridiculous, but don't be fooled by their appearance. Since needlefish swim close to the surface, they often leap over the decks of shallow boats. They do it accelerating up to 37 miles per hour. It's like a small car leaping out of the water right at you. Needlefish jumping activity is greatly excited by artificial light at night. Night fishermen and divers across the Pacific Ocean are regularly attacked by entire flocks of needlefish rushing towards the source of light at high speed. They're like moths, only moths don't have such sharp beaks. Using these beaks, needlefish are capable of inflicting deep puncture wounds, and for the people of the Pacific Islands, this fish represents a greater danger than a shark. The risk of getting injured during an encounter with a needlefish is much higher than from encountering a shark. Keep in mind, needlefish are found not only in the Pacific Ocean, in 2010, a Florida kayaker nearly died when a needlefish leapt out of the water and impaled her in the chest. Another person was seriously injured in an attack in May 2013 in the Red Sea when a needlefish speared under his knee. In October 2013, a Saudi Arabian news site reported the death of a young man due to hemorrhaging after being hit by a needlefish on the left side of the neck. And in 2014 in Vietnam, a fish from the needlefish family almost killed a tourist. The fish bit her neck and left pieces of its teeth in her spinal cord, paralyzing the woman. So yeah, needlefish are not the kind of fish you'd want to see. Although it's worth saying that the most common Asian carp can pose a threat too, especially if that's an invasive species that was introduced to the United States. There were times when Asian carps leaping out of the water into boats broke people's noses, jaws, and even arms. Some of them even knocked people down. The impact was that strong. These carps, which, by the way, can reach 24 inches in length, are found in abundance in the waters of the United States, and they leap on boats very actively. If you get off with just a bruise, consider yourself lucky. Well, now let's talk about something really rare. In 2010, a fisherman, Jeremy Wade, pulled a Goliath tigerfish out of the waters of the Congo River. He actually got incredibly lucky because catching a Goliath tigerfish is quite an achievement. This fish is quite elusive elusive and very dangerous. The thing is, the Goliath tigerfish is rightfully considered one of the scariest freshwater fish in the world. This is a larger and more dangerous version of piranha, which grows up to 5 feet and can weigh 110 pounds. Each of the 30-odd teeth of a Goliath tigerfish can grow to an inch, which means they're comparable to shark's teeth in size. With an arsenal like that, the Goliath tigerfish can easily attack not only people, but also crocodiles. Okay, let's be honest, it not only can do it, it actually does that, biting off whole chunks from crocodiles. So you realize people don't stand much chance either. It's believed that these fish attack in a reflex response to a sudden movement or splash, and they do it with stunning aggression. Goliath tigerfish only needs one bite to snap its prey in half. Well, if that's another fish we're talking about, of course, when it comes to a human, a bite like that can leave them without a finger. And that would actually be the best case scenario. There's no documented evidence of Goliath tigerfish killing people, however locals say that it used to happen. In general, compared to the Goliath tigerfish, all other creatures in today's video seem harmless and innocent. Though this doesn't mean I won't tell you about them. Here for example is an alligator gar. It can grow up to 10 feet long and is considered the largest of the seven known gar species. Some historical records claim that in the past, alligator gars could gain weight up to 350 pounds. And of course, they didn't get so big feeding on algae alone. The good news is that alligator gars don't attack humans. In any case, there weren't any reports of such attacks. 
The bad news is that these fish still pose a passive danger to us because of their eggs. Alligator gar eggs are poisonous if ingested. This is how alligator gars protect their offspring from predators like crustaceans. Adult alligator gars have few natural predators, and I believe the reason might be their scales, which are simply impossible to bite through. To cut through the fish's armor, people have to use wire cutters, tin snips, and a hatchet. This is why people rarely eat alligator gars. Well, you can imagine why, right? By the time you remove the scales, you'll no longer feel like eating. And since we're talking about gars, let's talk about a similar fish, northern pike, because they also have an interesting feature. Well, it's not scientifically confirmed, it's just a story told by fishermen. Anyway, it's believed that northern pikes shed their teeth in the middle of summer in order to grow new ones. It's like deer and antlers, only with teeth instead of antlers. If people could do that, imagine how much money we'd save on visits to the dentist. Researchers have been unable to find any evidence of whether pikes are shedding teeth or not. Maybe pikes are similar to sharks where one row of teeth is constantly being replaced with the next row of teeth as they break or fall out. Though actually, changing teeth is not something unusual for fish. There's even a fish species that loses 20 teeth each day. This is a Pacific lingcod, a vicious omnivorous fish with more than 500 randomly arranged teeth in its mouth. The Pacific lingcod actually loses and grows 20 teeth a day and feels just fine. Well, you can get it. Several dozens of teeth don't sound like much when you have several hundreds of them in your mouth, but how could such a large number of teeth fit in the mouth in the first place? Well, apparently the Pacific lingcod really wanted to have as many teeth as possible and didn't stop even when it ran out of space on its jaws. If you look inside the mouth on their palate, you'll see it's also covered in teeth. All the way at the back of the throat, right before the esophagus, there are pharyngeal jaws. Tooth-studded bony platforms made from modified gill arches. In short, this fish has teeth literally everywhere. When the Pacific lingcod attacks, its first set of jaws shoots forward and pulls the prey into the mouth, where the internal pharyngeal jaws begin to crush and shred the prey. That sounds terrifying. Especially considering that Pacific lingcods are aggressive. In one of the research centers where they were kept, the staff had to add tape to the corners of the tanks because the fish tried to jump out and attack everyone who passed by. You can understand why these fish act like this, because nature's made them active predators. The behavior of frogfish is entirely different, and they actually look strange for fish, as if someone first fashioned a normal fish out of plasticine, but then accidentally crumpled it. However, their appearance is of little interest to us. More importantly, frogfish, in fact, can't even swim. Yes, evolution not only gave them a weird shape, but also forgot to give them a swim bladder. Frogfish have to clumsily walk or jump on the seabed. Given all that, can they actually make good hunters? Turns out they can. When frogfish need to move quickly, they use jet propulsion, gulping water and forcing it through their back-facing gills. And they move really fast. Whenever prey is close, it takes only 6 milliseconds for the frogfish to react and grab it. For comparison, the reaction time of most people is 200 milliseconds. In this video, they tried to film the attack of the frogfish, but you can still hardly make anything out. Frogfish use their first dorsal fin as a fishing rod, luring prey closer. They wiggle their bait, mimicking a small fish that looks like lunch for their prey. Of course, the rod can break. But in this case, the frogfish have a plan. They can simply grow it back. Well, that was a fish that looked like crumpled plasticine. Now it's time to talk about a fish that looks like an underwater pug, or at least like it's very surprised or upset about something all the time. You, one ugly mother you know, this fish looks as if it had left for half an hour and then remembered it had forgotten to turn off the iron. Stargazers might be rather ugly, goggle-eyed creatures, but they're nevertheless formidable predators. To ambush their prey, these fish burrow into the sand, exposing only their mouths and eyes, which they rotate as hard as they can. This attracts the prey, which the stargazers then stun with electricity coming right from their eyes. I'm serious. They generate discharges like electric eels. Well, their discharge is weaker, only 50 volts compared to 600 volts generated by eels but this is quite enough. After getting a jolt, the prey can no longer fight back and the stargazers can have lunch. 
Turns out that these ridiculous looking creatures have killer eyes. Naturally, the discharge also works against predators, giving the stargazers enough time to break free and swim away. However, simply having bulging eyes and mimicking eels didn't seem good enough to these fish, and they grew a venomous spine near the pectoral fins. The venom is still poorly studied, but it seems to be dangerous enough not only for underwater creatures, in some cases it's known to have killed humans. Some of our viewers probably thought, now, <laughs> venom, big deal. Venomous fish don't surprise anyone anymore. In a way, I agree with that. What if we show you a fish shaped like a cube? This is a real underwater tank that creates a toxic cloud. The yellow boxfish looks funny and cute, lives in shallow water in the warmer parts of the world's oceans, loves coral reefs and seaweed. These fish spend most of their time pruning algae and small invertebrates such as crustaceans, worms, and sponges from rocks and coral with their tiny mouths. But having such a peaceful life in the wild would require you to have powerful protection. And these fish have it. Their body is made up of hexagonal bony plates fused together to form a hard yet lightweight shell. It encircles the inner real skeletal framework. Yes, these fish have grown something like tank armor. And being a living tank means you have some serious advantages. At the very least, the yellow box fish is damn hard to eat. Predators simply break their teeth on the armor, so they try not to take any risks. Well, in order to get such a body, these fish had to sacrifice speed and maneuverability. When you're a box with fins, it's quite difficult to be agile. But then evolution helped these fish out. It gave them a very cool ability when threatened or simply alarmed, the yellow box fish secrete a slimy toxin. It oozes from special cells all over the fish's body. Transparent toxic mucus, similar to snot, immediately disperses in the water column, creating a cloud of death around the fish. Due to this, box fish can be very difficult to keep in aquariums. A frightened box fish can accidentally poison all its mates. Or maybe it could do that on purpose. Who knows? Catfish that can talk. To be honest, this is not the kind of thing I expected to find out this morning. So meet Platodorus armatulus. When these catfish are scared or threatened, they make a croaking sound. And it's pretty funny. Sometimes catfish make these sounds when they're looking for their own kind. For example, if you separate one catfish from its school, it'll begin to croak. Actually, it's no coincidence that these catfish and their relatives are called talking catfish. Many of them can make audible sounds, and they do it in a number of ways. For example, they produce a loud clicking noise by rubbing their spiny pectoral fins against their body armor and then resonating their swim bladder using a muscle in the back of their skull. And if you still don't have a clue how it works, don't be upset. I also didn't get it. The anatomy of fish is quite complex. Fish are actually much more talkative than you might think. A recent study showed that they often communicate using sounds, and this feature has been present throughout the entire evolution of fish. Scientists claim that the ability to produce sound evolved independently 33 times. Some fish species have been talking for at least 155 million years, and apparently still have something to say. Early on, people only studied sounds that could be heard by the human ear above the water's surface. Later, an underwater microphone called a hydrophone helped discover that it's also quite loud under the water. Researchers believe that fish talk about a wide variety of subjects, including food and reproduction. They use sounds to attract females, scare away predators, protect food or territory. And you can even pick up differences in fish voices. Scientists have been recording the sounds of various fish for 18 months, and they got very interesting results. This is what, for example, terrapontids sound like during spawning. A real fish party. And this is the mullaway, also during a breeding season. The species behind the other two voices are unknown, but it's still worth checking them out. It's certainly surprising that they began to study the voices of fish not so long ago. However, scientists have excuses. First, they had to invent adequate equipment. And second, 
Well, who could even imagine fish could actually talk and do it so actively that this might be of interest to science? Researchers say that only a small part of the animal kingdom can imitate human speech. It's believed that the brain and vocal apparatus determine whether this is possible. That is, you need to be smart enough to make human sounds. You shouldn't expect some mice to suddenly speak perfect English. Although seals can do it. A seal named Hoover was especially good at this. He lived in the New England Aquarium in Boston and is believed to be the world's first mammal that was trained to imitate human speech. Hoover's mother died, but people managed to save the baby seal, so he grew up in an ordinary human family. At some point, Hoover began to imitate his owner's accent and say his most common phrases. When the seal grew up, they had to give him to the New England Aquarium, where scientists finally became interested in his talents. We know that Hoover could say phrases like, come over here, get out of here, and hello, how are you? Scientists were baffled by his ability to imitate human speech. They managed to establish that the seal speaks better than parrots, and Hoover became especially talkative during mating periods. He must have used the knowledge of the human language to get better chances with the ladies. Back then in the 1970s, it was still not clear what seals were capable of. Only decades later, scientists finally began to get to the bottom of things. For example, they've noticed that if you increase the noise level around young seals, they begin to raise their voice, just the way people do. Such results hint at the possibility that seals may have connections between their brain and larynx. So far, these connections have only been found in humans. Another study confirms the uncanny ability of seals to imitate human speech. They're indeed capable of learning and repeating many of the complex sounds fundamental to human speech. And it's not just about making clear vowels. Keep in mind this is a skill many of our closest primate relatives can't achieve. Seals can also recognizably sing the first few tunes of melodies. For example, the Star Wars theme song. Seals have a rare combination of traits that many other creatures don't, including a key anatomical advantage, a larynx or voice box, much like the one found in humans. It's still unclear why seals have such an exceptional ability and not some other animal. Perhaps this has something to do with their dynamic social structure. Who else can imitate human speech? Orcas, of course. I sometimes think orcas can do anything at all, if they really want to, of course. An international team of researchers working with two orcas in an aquarium in France found that orcas are capable of imitating human speech, including words like hello and bye-bye and a range of exclamations. Hello. <coughs> Amy. <coughs> One, two. <coughs> One, two, three. Bye-bye. <laughs> From this, we can conclude that orcas have the ability to memorize the sounds they hear. This also explains why orcas from different parts of the planet sound differently. Yes, orcas literally have dialects. And orcas from different regions might not quickly and easily understand each other. Most likely, they'll have to think and ask again if that's how animals generally converse. At the same time, scientists strongly doubt that orcas understand what they say. I mean, it's more of a mimicking with no real meaning behind it. There's no evidence that even one of the orcas understood what hello actually meant. Now to the story that really made me laugh. In 1984, handlers at the National Marine Mammal Foundation in San Diego heard a strange mumbling coming from a whale and dolphin tank. It sounded like a conversation between two people in the distance, but it was impossible to make out what exactly these people are talking about. However, the mumbling sounded over and over again. This went on until one day a diver surfaced from the tank and asked, who told me to get out? It was then that the handlers realized that all this time, it was a male beluga whale named Nak who was talking. They started recording his vocal exercises, and this kept going for several years. Turned out, Knox spoke both under the water and while on the surface, spontaneously and on command, 
alone and with people around. Though Nock didn't use human speech with his kin, I guess he thought they wouldn't understand it anyway. Interestingly enough, the rhythm and amplitude of his vocal bursts and the intervals between them were found to pattern those of human speech, as well as the main frequencies of the sound. They were somewhere a few octaves below the usual sound characteristics of his whale species. Nock copied people for about four years, but then reached maturity and stopped his vocal exercises. Either Nock has lost the ability to make human sounds or an interest in it. But why did Nock do it in the first place? Well, he just seemed to enjoy it. This was an animal who was willing to try anything. He was pleased to imitate speech, to observe people and their reactions, to establish a connection. In short, for Nock, it was a way of interacting with other species in an interesting way. And since beluga whales are capable of such tricks, elephants must be too. After all, aren't they one of the smartest animals on the planet? And we managed to find a couple of examples. Perhaps the most impressive one is an elephant named Kashik, who lives in Everland Theme Park near Seoul. Kashik mimics human speech and communicates with his keeper. Yeah, he can't boast a large vocabulary. He knows about five of the most primitive words, including no, good, and hello. It's said that Kashik makes a convincing impression of a human voice, but scientists don't believe that he actually understands the words he says. It's probably just senseless mimicking. It's not clear why Kashik started mimicking human speech at all, but cognitive biologists suggest it may be due to his childhood experiences. Kashik was the only elephant living in the zoo for about five years in his youth. At an important stage of development, he communicated only with people. This may well have influenced Kashik in such a way that he began to adapt his vocalization, making it more human. The logic behind this is very simple. If you make the same sounds as other members of your group, then you fit into this group better. This is also observed in other species capable of imitating someone else's speech. Too bad Steve and I don't know Korean, so we can't estimate how similar an elephant's speech is to a human's, but if there are those among you who understand Korean, share in the comments how you'd rate Kashik's pronunciation. Yeah. There was another elephant that seemed to be able to use a large amount of meaningful human speech, Batir. That was the elephant's name. He lived in a zoo in Kazakhstan in the Soviet Union and had a vocabulary of over 20 phrases. For example, he could ask the keepers for water and food, as well as praise or chastise himself. Apparently as a bonus, Batir imitated various sounds like barking, whistling, and a gnashing sound of rubber on glass. Soon these abilities attracted the attention of the media, and Batir's recordings ended up on the radio and television. The story of the talking elephant from Kazakhstan has also been included in several books on animal behavior and in the proceedings of several scientific conferences. Here's the thing, though. Batir's abilities have never really been studied by scientists, so it's likely that people simply indulged in wishful thinking, and Batir didn't really know how to speak in a meaningful human-like way. He just figured out how to make funny sounds. Well, since there are animals that imitate human speech, or perhaps even speak like a human, there's got to be animals that talk smack. You probably remember the story of the parrots at the zoo who learned a few curse words and were so prolific at swearing they had to be moved away from the visitors. But here we have a completely different story. It's about an Australian musk duck male named Ripper. Ripper was raised in captivity in the Tidbinbilla Nature Reserve and was once recorded making the sound of a slamming door as well as saying, you bloody fool. Researchers believe this is a phrase Ripper likely heard from his caretaker on numerous occasions. True, they're not sure how old the bird was when this phrase was first heard, but at the time of recording, Ripper was already four years old and he cursed like a human during an aggressive mating display. By the way, it's possible that the caretaker said to the duck, your bloody food, and Ripper imitated the word food instead of fool. But it's impossible to understand what exactly the bird meant, especially considering the fact that the recordings were made more than 30 years ago. <laughs> Though Ripper isn't the only example of a talking duck of this species, in 2000 there was another Australian musk duck in the same reserve which imitated a duck of a different species. It might not seem like anything special, because it's still bird talk, but it seems to me that ducks don't really care who to imitate. 
For them, these are just incomprehensible sounds that other animals make, just like we don't care what exactly we say when we meow to cats. We know that other musk ducks, this time from the UK, also use sound imitation, reproducing sounds like the coughing of their keeper and the squeaks of a turnstile. You probably know that many years ago, fish got out of the water and onto the land, but at that time it looked like this. Or something like that. Back then, the water was too crowded and there wasn't enough oxygen for everyone anymore. There were no predators on land, only insects crawling around, so fish grew paws and lungs and they became amphibians. And then, a few million years later, here we are. Hi. Okay. However, these fish have a slightly different purpose, because they're not planning to evolve. Meet the Anabas testudinius, commonly known as climbing perch. They pose a real danger to all living things. If you think you need to be bigger to be a threat, think of the Argentine ants that are slowly taking over the world. Compared to them, the climbing perch fish are still pretty big, can grow up to 9.8 inches in length and don't live in colonies, but that doesn't stop them from threatening any other species. See that sharp dorsal fin? It's only part of the climbing perch's armament. Their gill covers can change their position and are equipped with sharp needles. The fish use them to move around on land and to suffocate their enemies from the inside. Once a predator has swallowed a climbing perch, it will straighten its fins, expose its needles, and get stuck in the predator's throat. Sometimes this means instant death from lack of oxygen, while sometimes it causes a slower death from hunger. Anyone who decides to take a bite can end up in that situation. Larger fish, birds, turtles, even mammals if they decide to swallow a climbing perch. This fish won't make exceptions for anyone. Even holding it in your hands is a challenge. Both the gill covers and the fins are very sharp, and it's like trying to grab a very hot potato, which also wriggles. Very hot potato. <laughs> but let's suppose that birds start eating the climbing perch and their population starts reducing. So what? I mean, what's the big deal? It's natural selection and all that, right? Unfortunately, this works only in regions where the perch fish is already a part of the ecosystem. If they arrive at a new place, they can ruin literally everything. For example, the lack of birds can eventually lead to an increase in rodents or crop-destroying insects, and this is a serious problem. Up to 40% of the world's crops are already lost to plant pests and diseases. Insects alone cause $70 billion in damage each year. They're doing quite well even without the help of the climbing perch. Reducing the number of birds is just crazy, but the climbing perch doesn't care about any of that. They just take over new territories, and if someone tries to eat them, well, that's their problem. The climbing perch aren't interested in this domino effect, where one endangered species is followed by another, then by a third one, and so on until everything around changes. Of course, we shouldn't judge them. After all, they're simply fish. Boom. Fish that cause big trouble. But where did they come from in the first place? As is often the case, scientists take a long time before studying the really important things. We don't know exactly where the climbing perch came from, but they probably appeared in Southeast Asia. Over the past four decades, they've made their way south through Indonesia, and they don't plan to stop. Apart from killing predators, the climbing perch can adapt easily. Like many other fish that have learned to go on land, they always have a plan B. If the waters where they live are too crowded, the climbing perch can get out and crawl into another body of water. If that one dries up, they'll just wait in the mud or find another place to live. Not enough food? They can get out on land. There should be something else there. Wow, these fish are cooler than Schwarzenegger. I hate Plan B. But how do you even move around on land if you're a fish? I mean, don't you think that's a bit of a contradiction? Climbing perch have figured it out and have grown a special organ for breathing on land. It holds some water and hydrates the gills, allowing the fish to live without water for days. But the climbing perch needs to keep its entire body moist to feel good, so the fish prefers to travel at night or in the early morning when they're still due. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But you can't just go from India to Australia on dew. After all, there are seas, different straits, long distances. So the climbing perch hitch a ride. They cling to the bottom of fishing boats and go wherever it takes them. It's very convenient when you can live in waters with different salinity, isn't it? Plus, a person can bring a climbing perch with them after accidentally catching them with the rest of the fish. 
I wouldn't be surprised if climbing perch have already learned to pretend to be dead so that when they get to a new territory, they can just get out of the boat and go about their business. This is how the climbing perch are expanding their influence, getting closer and closer to Australia, and since the local species evolved independently of the rest of the planet, one can only guess what kind of blow the newcomers can inflict. People are literally taught to recognize the climbing perch and immediately report them to the authorities, perhaps the police. It's a bird! It's a plane! No, it's Superman! Are you crazy? It's a climbing perch! We have to inform the authorities! Yeah, it's that serious. News about the climbing perch approaching Australia sounded like a declaration of war. Native species can be as deadly as they want, but they're just not used to such an adversary. Imagine a cactus that suddenly grew where no one had ever seen a cactus and no one was prepared for it. Animals are curious. They try to eat the spikes. They hurt themselves, and at best, they get injured. The same thing will happen with the fish. Even the spikes are pretty similar, and it'll take more than a century to get used to such a neighbor and learn to live next to it. <sighs> if you can get used to a climbing perch at all, where are all the Steves? Haven't you heard? They went to another lake. Finally. In a familiar environment, native species know their limits. Predators already know how and who to eat, prey learn to fight back, and add to this the climatic conditions. All of this creates a rather fragile but perfect balance. But as soon as some resilient species gets in the way, everything turns to chaos. <laughs> Such species are known as invasive, and in most cases, they are brought into a new territory by humans, sometimes by accident, but the effect is still impressive. For example, at the end of World War II, the brown tree snake was accidentally brought to Guam. Perhaps the snake was in the cargo or even climbed in by the landing gear and ended up in paradise. There were almost no natural predators for the snake in Guam, but there were many prey animals that weren't used to being hunted. As a result, the tree snake began to breed at an alarming rate. The snakes exterminated most of the local vertebrate species. They caused thousands of power outages affecting private, commercial, and military activities. Those same snakes were also responsible for the death of poultry and pets, as well as the emotional trauma of residents. Imagine an animal that is not from around suddenly showing up at your house, like a lion or a hippo or even a snake, which moreover is venomous and dangerous for small children. Anybody would be stressed. In short, the snakes had a great time. Mission complete. And because Guam is a major transport hub in the Pacific, the snake's journey didn't end there. It's been seen on other islands and even in Texas, far enough from Australia, its native land. That's what invasive species do. Over the past 500 years, they've caused the death of 13% of all extinct species. Invasive species have been one of the causes of extinction for 25% of plants and 33% of animals. But snakes, fish, ants, and I don't know, cow parsnip aren't like the sudden meteorite that wiped out more than 75% of species when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. This means we have to stop those animals that are trying to take over new territories. Among other things, something will have to be done about the climbing perch. You shall not pass! Yes, yes. Thank you, Gandalf. Anyone else have any suggestions? Fish out every fish we can get our hands on? That would help, but only for a while before the climbing perch breed comfortably again. Then maybe poison? Whoa, whoa, that's too harsh. I mean, it would help get rid of the climbing perch, of course, but the local fish would be poisoned along with them. What's the point then? So it's pretty much the same. First, something happens because of human activity, and then this something needs to be fixed. And by the way, what about Australia? Enough time has passed since the first alarming reports. Have the fish made it down there? Well, it looks like somehow people managed to slow them down. Or they got there, and now there's no one to tell us about the disaster. Some laws of nature seem, well, fundamental. The sun rises in the east, lions hunt antelopes, and trees grow from the bottom up. Everything is simple and clear. And then you find out that frogs eat snakes. Really? Ain't that supposed to be the other way around? But American bullfrogs are like, ha, ah, come to Texas, we'll show you what's what. Bullfrogs are considered one of the largest frog species on the planet, up to six inches long and weighing about a pound. And that's just an average bullfrog. Bullfrogs don't croak. They make a bellowing heard from far away, but not when the bullfrog is on the hunt. These nocturnal predators sit quietly in ambush waiting for a snake to crawl past, then they quickly lunge with their powerful hind legs. 
got it! The prey's trapped in a huge frog mouth. Try explaining to the bullfrog that it's the snakes that are supposed to eat them, not vice versa. While some snakes end up as a frog snack, others offer a ride to cane toads, mice, and beetles to save them from the flood. You can sometimes see that in Australia when both olive pythons and eastern brown snakes are used as emergency taxi service. That is, species that usually feed on their passengers. Perhaps it was a very selfless thing to do, or maybe the snakes just scheduled dinner for later and took it with them. Well, you know, takeout is usually cheaper than delivery. Let's head to Latin America, where scientists found one of the strangest fish known to humans in the mangroves. Mangrove rivulus is usually 0.4 to 1.5 inches long, lives in muddy pools and flooded crab burrows in mangrove swamps, or inside logs. On land. Yes, this fish lives on land and can stay out of water for not just half an hour or a day, but up to 66 days in a row. Of course, this happens during the dry spell, otherwise it wouldn't get there. It's pretty hard to pull off something like that when you're a fish, but these ones nail it. They modify their gills to retain water and nutrients, and waste products like nitrogen are excreted through their skin. As soon as the water returns, the fish rolls back to the previous buildup. Actually, this species is very territorial, but when it has to live through a drought, the fish curbs its aggression. After all, it can be a little crowded in the logs. By the way, they don't need a partner to breed and also make cool jumps. Yes, right on the ground. When you live on land for two months, you gotta get around somehow, right? The next stop on our journey is Bacoli, Italy. Early in the video, I said that trees usually grow from the bottom up. At the ruins of Bea, an ancient Roman resort, things work a little differently. There's a fig tree growing upside down right from the ceiling of the arch, which is actually an architectural site. They say this arch was part of the villa owned by the Emperor Nero, but he probably wouldn't know why the tree broke the laws of physics. Moreover, I didn't find any reliable information about this fig tree, neither how it ended up in the arch or how it survived, but it continues to grow upside down. It even seems to be bearing fruit. How about the fruits on the trunk? In the south of Brazil, there's a place where you can find Jabuticaba tree, but only in the states of Minas Gerais, Goiás, and Sao Paulo. You can find round, dark berries that seem stuck to the trunk only in season for just a few weeks when the tree bears fruit. The berries have a thick skin and a very sweet center. Yeah, you can eat them. I was ready for something dangerous and quite poisonous, but they say these berries are delicious. They're mostly eaten fresh, but the fruits begin to ferment just three to four days after they're picked. So you have to do it fast or make jam out of them. Bake a pie. Look, I'm already drooling. What's next on the script, Steve? All right, so mosquitoes. Mosquitoes that live everywhere. Elephant mosquitoes are quite large. You can find them in forests. They prefer to stay active during the day. They're surprisingly beautiful for mosquitoes. No, seriously, just take a look at them. I've never seen such beautiful bloodsuckers. Maybe it's because elephant mosquitoes don't actually drink blood. Adult insects subsist on carbohydrate-rich substances, like the liquid waste that aphids secrete. The juice of damaged plants, fruits, nectar, and even refuse are on their menu. In short, they don't eat anything even close to blood. They don't even want to try. Why risk your life when you can find a peach? It definitely won't swat you. But the larvae of these mosquitoes hunt the larvae of other mosquitoes. You get it right. Elephant mosquitoes actually help humans, and they're good at it. The larvae, as it usually happens, are very voracious. Just one elephant mosquito larva can eat up to 5,000 larvae of other mosquitoes before it matures. This can take from a few weeks to six months. Can you imagine how many dangerous larvae they can destroy over this time? Since we mentioned larvae that usually live in water, it's time to move to India, the native land of water buffaloes. By the way, about 90% of these animals live in Asia. These are really large bulls that can weigh up to 2,600 pounds and grow to almost 10 feet. Most importantly, water buffaloes love water. While everyone knows that hippos spend most of their time in the water, you don't expect such behavior, well, from relatives of cows. The answer lies in the sweat glands. Water buffaloes have too many of them, especially for their size. They're less tolerant of direct sunlight, which means they can die from heat exposure. Water buffaloes need constant cooling and they realize this, so they don't go far from the water willingly. Some prefer deep waters, some simply roll in mud pits 
which they dig using their horns. Water buffaloes have wide hooves and special structure of the joints to avoid getting stuck in the mud or silt at the bottom of the ponds. If you've ever swum in a place like this, you realize this could happen, especially if you're a buffalo, a big and heavy animal. Also, when water buffaloes are really hungry, they simply dive to the bottom and eat what they find there. I think that's probably grass, but still, I wouldn't dive in a pool with a hungry water buffalo. Better safe than sorry. And if you think water buffaloes don't live up to their name, here's a story for you. During a flood in the Philippines, a farmer was able to get out by riding a water buffalo. Apparently, this animal doesn't care what's around it, a lake or dirty water after heavy rains. The farmer also took a cow with him. But let's leave the water and add some lava to this video. There's a lava cactus growing in the Galapagos Islands, and it looks, well, like a cactus. But it grows only on recent lava flows. Of course, even these cacti need the surface to harden first, cool down and all that. But still, most plants and animals wouldn't like this habitat. Remember Mordor? Doesn't look like a blooming valley, does it? But that's because Sauron simply didn't have lava cacti. They're not studied too well, but here's what I've realized. When cacti anchor themselves in cracks, the bacteria in their roots literally begin to eat the lava. This releases the beneficial minerals that help the cactus grow, and the cactus, in turn, provides food for animals. And even when the lava cactus dies, its work isn't done yet. The cactus turns into hummus. Well, where there's hummus, there's fertile soil for other plants. The only downside of the lava cactus is its shape. It looks like, well, your grandma might find it inappropriate. Okay, let's move on to more YouTube-friendly topics. In South Africa, there are slacker bees who refuse to work. Everyone thinks bees are arduous workers who are always busy. And this is actually quite true. Bees keep working all their lives. In a day, one bee can visit more than a thousand flowers. So by the evening, it's so exhausted it doesn't care about anything sweet or even about especially tasty flowers. Well, you know, this feeling when you're so tired that you just don't care about anything? A worker bee flies about 500 miles in its life. That's over five or six weeks. That's the limit beyond which lies only death. Of course, bees have rest when they sleep. It takes them about five to seven hours a day and the rest of the time they work. But not the cape honey bees. Thanks to a genetic mutation, they've learned to reproduce without a queen bee, simply by cloning themselves. And if there's no queen bee, then you don't have to work. These bees sneak into other beehives and lay their eggs there so that others can feed and care for their offspring. These larvae mature and grow almost as big as queens, and like queens, they can breed, which means they don't do any work. They just walk around the hive looking like they own everyone. This quickly results in the collapse of the hive, but before this happens, the cape honeybees have enough time to chill, and then they find another hive and leave their clones there. If you think weird things can only happen on Earth, check out Mars, where sunsets and sunrises are blue. Also, the sun looks very small from there. Though this is actually no mystery, Mars is farther away from it, so the sun appears only about two-thirds the size we see on Earth. What's with the color? Mars is known as the red planet. Its soil is rich in iron oxide, so it has a reddish hue. But when fine dust rises, blue light can penetrate the atmosphere much more efficiently than any other light. That explains the blue sunsets, since the atmosphere is different on each planet. On Uranus, for example, the sunset sky changes from blue to turquoise. And on Titan, one of Saturn's moons, the sky changes from yellow to orange and brown as the sun dips below the horizon. In 2010, a very scary story happened on the Unza River a tributary of the Volga. A woman named Vera was swimming in the river when she suddenly noticed something weird approaching her. This something swam up to her, bumped into her leg, and then she felt a sharp pain. If this happened in the sea, one could suspect that it was a shark. But this happened in the river. Turns out it wasn't a shark, but a huge catfish who decided to eat the woman. The fish sank its teeth into the woman's leg and didn't let go until people forced it to retreat. Later, doctors discovered more than 20 minor wounds on the injured leg, all left by fish teeth. This could cause infection and damage to the ligamentous apparatus, bleeding, vascular injuries, 
Just think about it. A catfish did all this. The fish that's supposed to be chilling at the bottom. And if you start to dig deeper, it becomes clear that catfish attacks happen much more often than you would hope. Some of the stories are actually frightening. In the 60s, not far from the Russian city of Khabarovsk, a huge catfish not only attacked a person, but also dragged him underwater. I don't know how the story ended, but the locals had to ask the military for help. It seems to me that the key reason why catfish act like that lies in their diet. Catfish eat everything. Seriously, they don't even care what species they're having for dinner. Every now and then, you hear stories about a catfish dragging a dachshund to the bottom or biting a kid. Yes, it does sound like an urban legend. The thing is, there's actually tons of evidence of catfish swallowing ducklings in the spring and even drowning adult ducks. Rats also become their prey. Catfish are also smart enough to assess their strengths and even come up with strategies. Young catfish team up to hunt pigeons that fly in shallow water. Although they never do this when they grow up, larger individuals track prey for a long time before attacking. The stomachs of catfish caught in France are often full of undigested bird legs. That is, these are not isolated cases. Catfish actually prey on pigeons. Naturally, even for the largest catfish, a human being is too large of a prey, but this doesn't mean the catfish won't attack humans. For example, to protect their eggs. And I'm not exaggerating when I say there are many stories of terrible catfish attacks. A large catfish has long lived in a reservoir near the Russian city of Lipat. According to eyewitnesses, it was a really huge creature that devoured all the inhabitants of the reservoir, and even dogs that accidentally ended up in the water. One day, that catfish even ate a pig who was puddling around in shallow water. The fish that ate a pig. Can you imagine that? Now let's remember a very disturbing fact. Pigs and humans are very alike, and even genetically compatible. Does this mean we should be careful around catfish too? Well, maybe. Steve found out that sometimes they find human fingers in the stomachs of caught catfish. No, catfish don't bite them off from living people. They don't mind the drowned ones, though. The more decomposed the body is, the softer it becomes and the stronger it smells. And catfish really love this. But this doesn't mean catfish will grow to appreciate the taste of human flesh and start eating living people. However, in some reservoirs with a large number of catfish, they introduced a swimming ban. Why do you think they did it? Well, probably not because the authorities are afraid that someone will accidentally step on the catfish and slip. And as it usually happens, the omnivorous animal gets a nice bonus from nature and begins to spread literally everywhere at a terrible rate. A few decades ago, near Cologne, fishermen were surprised, yet happy, when they started to reel in catfish. Seemed like that was proof of how clean the water in the river was. But then the number of catfish began to soar. Every year, there were more of them. In 2010, more than 14 tons of catfish were caught in the Rhine. Moreover, catfish not only bred at a terrible rate in one region, they also spread to other water bodies. Today, catfish can be found throughout entire Europe. Until recently, Scandinavia was the only catfish-free place, simply because it was too cold there. Temperature, by the way, is one of the reasons catfish spread so fast. Catfish are thermophilic. So they multiply so fast due to industrialization and global warming. Well, it's always the reason. Also, people purposely release catfish fry so that they grow up and they can catch them later. Who knew the catfish would start catching humans? Oh, and don't forget these fish live long. Of course, not as long as the Greenland sharks, but the five foot long catfish can be about 40 years old. The age of the largest caught catfish is estimated at 70 years. Its length reached almost 6.6 .6 feet. Do you realize how big that is? Being this huge, you can easily eat whatever you want. In short, apparently, the catfish keeps growing all its life without any limitations, and the bigger the catfish gets, the more it eats. People who don't know catfish can grow to incredible size often think they get so big due to radiation. Well, what else is to blame? Radiation and pollution especially given that giant catfish were found in the cooling pond of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Though actually, radiation has nothing to do with it. First, it usually works in exactly the opposite way. Animals get sick and die before they can get big enough. Second, the species caught in Chernobyl are supposed to be large. I mean, originally. 
Moreover, there's evidence of catching the same catfish in regions with no radiation. The catfish there were actually even larger. Radioactive catfish are just lucky creatures that have plenty of food and no predators around. Most likely, in a couple of decades, they'll become even bigger. Of course, the bigger the catfish, the larger its prey. Why waste energy and time catching some small fish when you can eat something more nutritious? That's why catfish eat almost anything that they can fit in their mouths. It all starts quite harmlessly, with annelid worms, gastropods, crustaceans, and insects. But as soon as the catfish grows up, frogs, fish, and even other catfish appear on its menu. The diet of gigantic catfish includes birds, small mammals like dogs, and even sheep. They swallow them whole. And catfish can afford all that. Not only because of the size, as I said, catfish are smart enough to come up with different hunting strategies. They do realize very well what they're doing. And besides, nature has blessed catfish with everything they need for hunting. For example, they have a well-developed sensitivity which allows them to sense the vibration of prey. Catfish are great at adapting to new food sources when they appear. That is, they're happy to expand their menu. You can't be close to a catfish and hope it doesn't eat you because you're new here. Catfish also adopt new hunting strategies when needed, such as catching pigeons from the land. They also analyze the migration paths of salmon or herring, even if they see them for the first time, and then take a convenient position to hunt, and their hunting is successful. Well, I think I've already mentioned catfish can team up in order to chase prey. Overall, it seems like if you live in water, the only way to escape the catfish that think you'll make a good dinner is to stop breathing. Fish of the Platosis genus live in the Indian Ocean, the Western Pacific Ocean, and New Guinea. They say their tails look like those of eels, but their long barbels sticking out from their faces are much more interesting. They house taste buds that allow the fish to detect chemicals in the water around them. They are so sensitive they can pick up the smallest changes in the acidity of the water. For example, those produced by the breathing of the bristleworms. Just exhale, and that's it, the catfish has found you. Thanks to this ability, these fish can hunt even in complete darkness. Oh, by the way, Ever heard of noodling? It's a way of catching catfish using your bare hands. A person puts his hand into the catfish hole underwater and pulls it out. But it's much more complicated than it seems. First, the noodler fumbles for the hole in the water. If everything goes according to plan, the catfish grabs the noodler's hand, after which the noodler pulls the catfish out with both hands. Well, I don't even know what could possibly go wrong here, especially considering everything I've already told you about catfish. The biggest danger for a noodler is the risk of drowning. The water's too deep, and you don't have a friend around to help. A large catfish can keep you underwater for much longer than you can hold your breath. You also need to be physically strong and hardy enough because the catfish will fight back. Even a fish weighing about 66 pounds will become a formidable opponent. Remember, this fish is in its element, and it's capable of eating a sheep. With just one blow, a catfish is quite capable of fracturing a person's ribs. And if at this time you're trying your best to hold your breath and not drown, then, well, things aren't looking great for you. So no wonder noodling is considered a very dangerous activity compared to other ways of fishing. It can literally kill people. There are occasional news reports covering this. Perhaps catfish kill many more people than we know. People who faced an aggressive catfish say that its bite is similar to the bite of a teething puppy. But don't think it's painless. Catfish may not have fangs, but they do have maxillary teeth. Thick rows of inward curving barbs designed to let food in, but not out. When clamped on a human's arm, catfish also have a nasty tendency to bear down and spin, like a sharpener on a pencil. This can result in tearing skin off. Let me remind you, these guys love carrion, and their teeth aren't exactly clean. Just when you start realizing that encountering an ordinary catfish is not the best thing that could happen to you, you learn about electric catfish. They can generate a shock of up to 350 volts to stun unsuspecting prey. However, the catfish themselves are not only immune to their own discharges, seems like they can't be shocked at all. Props to evolution for this immunity. Not so long ago, scientists compared the response of electric catfish and goldfish to various stimuli, observing the movements of fish after exposure to electrical discharges from another catfish and electrodes. 
While the goldfish were severely electrocuted by the electric catfish and completely immobilized by the electrodes, the electric catfish seemed to be completely unaffected by any of the shocks. I'm not even sure it noticed them. Why is this happening? So far, no one knows. Though we know for sure that people have not yet become victims of electric catfish, a large catfish can only stun a person. Well, remember that catfish keep growing all their lives. Who knows? Maybe there's a catfish somewhere that's big enough to kill a human. See you later.